Hi and welcome to Four Wheels Good, the only motoring show with more motoring talk than a Dodge Viper and more frenzied action than the pits of the Formula One Championship. This week we'll be tearing around the largest indoor mini-karting circuit in the country. John Wright will be making sure we don't make a mess of ourselves and our cars using paint sprays in our regular Inside Motors feature. And then we'll be basking in the sun down in the New Forest as we join the Fiat 500 Owners Club. And to wind down, we'll be taking tea once again with racing legend Sterling Moss and finding out what he has to say on Villeneuve and the rest of the Grand Prix set. But first, we've got more from Ginny Buckley's recent sojourn to Barcelona, where she found out about a remarkable deal between Mercedes and the design genius behind Swatch. And she also takes a sneak preview of some new cars from Daewoo. I've been picking up a few facts on my visit here at the Barcelona Motor Show. For example, did you know that the average car will carry just 1.2 passengers on a typical journey? That the cars in Europe spend around half their time travelling only 20 miles a day? Or that a car will spend on average 90% of its time either stuck in traffic jams or parked somewhere? Now when you start to think about those facts, you think that there must be a huge market out there for a special type of vehicle. A tiny little car that can carry just two passengers and a bit of luggage. A car that's small enough to park in the tightest of spots. One that's very economical and cheap to run. And as a bonus, one that's good to the environment too. Surely a smart manufacturer would be able to figure that one out. trying to do is to change the face of city mobility if you like. We realise that there are lots of problems with driving cars around cities but on the other hand that people still want to have a car so we're trying to build a car that will solve some of those problems. And when you talk about we, who are you talking about? Who's actually developing and making right. the vehicle? We're a joint venture and um, we're called Micro Compact Car. We're 51% Daimler Benz or Mercedes Benz as it's better known and 49% SMH which is the owner of the Swatch brand amongst others. And that's so, very strong in the design, that Swatch very influence. Much. Isn't very it? big marketing influence from Swatch, yeah. Where will the car actually be manufactured and made? We're building it in France, um, in Lorraine, a place called Hamburg. We're building a special factory um, to build it there and that's going to go into production in autumn of this year. Now I know that you're talking very much with the smart car about, um, about lifestyle, about improving the quality of life and also the environment. Have you carried that through into the, that ethos through into the development and the building and to the manufacturing? Absolutely. I mean, we always say that the environmental process has to start with production and go through to what you know the car is using in the way of fuel on the roads. I mean, it'll have a very low fuel consumption. We'll be doing on the petrol 60 to the gallon or on the diesel 80 to the gallon. But at the same time, you know, even on the building site in Hambach, we're making sure that we look after natural resources. How can we expect the vehicle to be priced when it goes on sale? And when does it go on sale? All right, it's going on sale in continental Europe in March 98, um, so not too long to wait now. It's going to be priced around 16,000 Deutsche Marks, which I'm not sure of the exact about, rate. About seven, about, seven and a half thousand about pounds. That, yeah. The other question is, will we be able to get it in the UK? Because we're I looking at other markets very seriously at the moment. We're looking at the USA, the Far East, and other markets like the UK and um, Scandinavia. So we'll be deciding later this year. At the moment, we're concentrating on continental Europe, but. Would you like to Could see it there, yes. being a Brit I personally yourself? would, yes, very much. I should bring my Swiss registered one over anyway, yeah. Who do you think is going to buy it? Um, the kind of focus target groups are like singles and dinks, I would say. Um, they're quite important for us. But we also see a lot of potential with families that have more than one car in the household. Another interesting group for us is like retired people, where perhaps the kids have moved away from home. They do longer journeys by plane and train, but they, you know, they want to be mobile in the city. And we've got planned for the end of 99 um, a hybrid version which combines electric and diesel. So I 
think there'll be quite an interesting yeah. market for that. And what kind of speeds are we going to be able to get to in our smart car? It could go very fast, but we're <laughs> limiting its electronicity to 130 kilometres per hour, whatever that is in miles. It's, it's enough for anyone, I it's think, enough. though. I mean, it's, it's basically going to be in the city, so we think that's a reasonable thing to do, but it's very sporty to drive. And how many are you hoping and planning to sell? Um, the capacity of the factory is 200,000 per year, so we'd be up to that by about 2001. So we could be smarted out all over the place I by the next so. century. Yes. Is that an order? <laughs> <laughs> My sister wants one. I think you're going to, she, yeah, she's 16 okay. and she's really keen, so I think you're going to have, nice. yeah, the younger people definitely, but I yeah. think so. Yeah. I'd be tempted. <laughs> Well, you come to the Barcelona Motor Show with all this art and history around you and you find a chap from England working for a Korean company who have probably one of the biggest stories here. Well, you do, don't you? What's the story here that they are launching at this relatively small show? Well, in, in our own quite small way, we're, uh, we're telling the world we've got three brand new cars. The first time Dave's had three of its own uh, in-house developed cars uh, on the market ever. So it's a, it's a very big moment. And the reason we're here is that um, they go on sale next month in uh, some continental European markets, although we don't get them for quite some time in the UK. When are we going to see them in the UK? Uh, we don't have definite dates yet, but uh, certainly by early next year we'll have all three of them. As quickly as you can manage it, I should imagine. Absolutely, yeah. So what have we got? Tell us what the three cars are. Um, three cars are called Lanos, Nubira and Laganza. Lanos is the smallest of the three. Um, it fits into the lower medium segment, so it'll be competing against cars like the Vauxhall Astra. Uh, Nubira fits into the lower part of the upper medium segment, um, so it'll be competing against cars like the uh, Rover 400 and the Hyundai Elantra, and then Laganza uh, is slightly bigger than anything we've currently got, and that'll be competing against uh, cars like the Honda Accord in size. You're telling me now, Mark, about three new cars that are manufactured, it's the first time you've manufactured your own vehicles, but as a company, dare you, are very diverse, aren't they? You've been telling me a few amazing facts about the kind of things you're involved in. Well, extremely diverse, um, pretty much everything from sportswear to spacecraft and everything in between. We're the world's second biggest shipbuilder, for instance, and uh, sixth biggest electronics company in the world. Um, People, most people in the UK will own something by day without even realising it because we produce a lot of goods for other people, well-known consumer electronics brands and so on. So why is this the first time that they have manufactured their own vehicles? Why has it not happened sooner? Well, when we're, uh, we're new boys on the block really. Uh, until 1992 we had a joint venture with General Motors. We split from them then um, with the aim of becoming a fully independent car manufacturer and what you're seeing now is the fruits of that. So uh, between then and now we've developed a whole raft of new models and there's plenty more to come. And what else can we expect to see from Deo? Can we expect a cabriolet, a coupe, a sports car? We can expect sports cars, we can expect cabriolets, we can expect uh, mini cars, um, everything right up to uh, large luxury vehicles. Um, whatever is in demand in the market, we're going to produce and we're going to produce it uh, as quickly as we produce these cars. So between now and the end of the decade, watch out. Ginny Buckley back in Barcelona and Ginny will be test driving the latest Deus later in the year. As always, road safety is an issue which has a very high profile, and that's not surprising when you see the statistics on road accidents and deaths. Mike Rutherford is never far from the issues of the day, and this week he's been talking to Ginny about road deaths and a campaign with a happy ending. Mike, we're all very shocked and surprised by that heart-hitting report you did on the A2 death trap recently, because you are a man that's not known for that serious side, but it really is. A, a passion of yours, isn't it? Something you feel very yeah, strongly about. Yeah, I mean, about. just to remind people, what we did was we looked at a few accident black spots, and what, perhaps I should have mentioned in the piece, actually, what happened, ever happened to those signs? Do you remember when you were a kid, you used to see a sign that had lots of accidents, you used to warn people, accident black spot. For those younger viewers, that means that people would slow down and say, oh, I don't want to be the next victim. You don't see those signs anymore, and it seems to me that you don't see the authorities taking too much notice of roads that quite clearly are accidents waiting to happen and we highlighted a few weeks ago uh, the A2 in Kent, the gateway to Europe. You might say, well what's, this? what's the big deal about the A2? The A2 is so significant because it's a motorway type road, six lanes, you've got people coming to and from Europe, it's the gateway to Europe and we found there, and I think we're looking at footage of it now, a ridiculous slip road from a very busy um, restaurant come petrol station where people were being forced to join this three-lane carriageway without an adequate slip road. And we stood there with Ted Clements, the uh, chief instructor 
at the uh, and road safety uh, guru at the Inst Institute of Advanced Motorists, and we asked him his opinion. He said it was one of the worst slip roads he'd ever seen in his life anywhere. But since then, there've been some developments, haven't there? Well, that's the amazing thing. Only a few weeks later, look at this. I mean, these pictures say it all. Remember the before? Well, here's the after. After we go in and highlight the problem. This is what the authorities do. Now we've got police officers driving past that site day in, day out for years. We've got Department of Transport officials, we've got councillors, we've got road safety officers, we've got all sorts of people. What about interested people with a vest vested interest, i.e. the drivers themselves? You would have thought that somebody would have raised this problem, that the problem would have been cured. Nobody did that. We went out on a limb. We accused the authorities and others of creating probably the most dangerous slip road in Britain, they reacted within weeks. And the amazing thing is, of course, with so many things like this, it doesn't actually cost a lot of money to correct the problem. All it really means is sending a gang of guys along for a day to repaint the road. It's, you know, we're talking about white paint on a road surface going down, replacing the previous white paint that was on that road surface, and potentially saving lives. And you say it's a passion of mine, it absolutely is, because at the end of the day, the fast cars and the glamorous lifestyle and e meeting interesting car designers and engineers and race drivers, I mean, that's unimportant. The important thing is that you've got a, a car that keeps you safe, that's why I drive a Volvo, and secondly, you know, how safe are these roads we're on? I mean, you know, we're talking about three and a half thousand people killed in Britain on the roads every year. We're talking about 45,000 people in Europe. Just think about it. 45,000 people in Europe killed every year on the roads. 850 people a week. Just think about that. Think of a football stadium with 45,000 people in it. You know, Man United or somebody playing on a Saturday afternoon. 45,000 people. Imagine all those people being wiped out. It's a shocking thought. And oh. You, you obviously feel strongly about it. Okay, this is one isolated incident and, and a result's come from it, which is fantastic. But what, what else can be done? What, what are you well, doing? I mean, I, I think that uh, what I'd like to do, what I'd really like to do, to be honest with you, I'd like to kind of spearhead some safety campaign. Although, what I, what the first thing I'd do, well, I'm now. volunteering. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I really would. I'd like to get involved with some sort of charity or something. Uh, and and actually what I'd do is stop using this word safety because safety is a turn off. If you say, you know, road... It's not exciting safety, is no, it? No, no, it's not a sexy subject, but it's the most vital subject, you know. If, and if you think about the road safety officer at your school, you know, he was always the man in the grey suit and hush puppies, wasn't he? The boring old git. But, uh, you know, safety shouldn't be like that. We sh safety should be like life-saving, you know, there's nothing boring about a lifesaver. Um, it sounds quite glamorous, well, exactly. the emergency services. And what, and what it almost needs is, you know, somebody, it almost needs a, a Baywatch type person. Not that that's me, of course, because <laughs> I don't look me. anything <laughs> like Pam Anderson. But it almost needs somebody... Oh, you know, in the right light, you, <laughs> you never, never know. know. Um, but it almost <laughs> needs that kind of change yeah. of emphasis, and it needs to be more glamorous. And it, we, we need to go, you know, there are kids in school today. You, you must have seen them. You said, I was in a pub the other day. Two young guys walked in. I was horrified. They went up to the bar. And I expected them to order two pints of lager, the sort of thing that I would have done when I was there age 18. And then before the, you know, 10 seconds later, ordered another couple of pints of lager. These guys are drinking orange juice, you know, and then one of them had a cranberry juice and a mineral water. People, young kids are worried about their health. They're worried about their looks. They, they spend a lot of money on cosmetics, going down to the gym, wearing nice clothes. Then they go out on the road. They're not qualified to stay alive. You know, they're in grave danger of damaging their clothes and damaging their looks and damaging their health. And so we need a massive road safety campaign and we need to make minor improvements. Of course, it's very expensive to build a bypass around a shopping center, but as, as this A2 example proves, you know, all you've got to do is change the paint on the road. And it doesn't cost anything. If there are people out there watching who have a similar road situation close to them, what Contact Mike. Well, yeah, I mean, write to us, drop us a line at Men and Motors and tell us about these accident black spots. And also, you know, if you can't be bothered to do that, at least put in a phone call to your local authority or the Department of Transport and say, hey, here's an accident waiting to happen. I want something done about it. I mean, it is plain unacceptable to have anything like 45,000 people dying on the roads in Europe every year. You know, this is like the equivalent of a, a plane crash in Europe every week. You know, I mean, that would make headline news every week if a plane went down every week in Europe. This is like the equivalent of a plane going down and nobody taking any notice of it. I mean, the cost to society, the, you know, the, the anxiety, the anguish it, that it causes 
uh, the families of the bereaved, and, and that's before we start talking about the injuries. There's something like 1.5 million injuries a year on the roads in Britain. We've got to be better educated, and we've got to get this motoring thing into context. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it gives us a lot of freedom, but it takes a lot of lives as well, and they're lives that are preventable. Mm, and it's nice to see that it is possible to make some headway in getting things improved on the road. After the break, we'll be heading down to the south coast where a little Italian car with a large following has been pondering its past with one foot in the present. We'll see you then. Hi, welcome back. Now, the Fiat 500 is a car which not long ago was looked upon as being a ridiculous mini, but these days it's got a big following. Since the production of this little marvel was ceased, an appreciation of its design and engineering has grown to such an extent that nowadays you'd be hard-pressed to find someone who doesn't like it. Richard Warren reports. Well, it's summertime, and it's this time of year when all the owners' clubs in the country get together to do their sunny runs through the country lanes of uh, Britain, and the Fiat Club is no exception. Today we're in Lyndhurst, we're with David Johnson, who's the president of the Fiat 500 Club, and you're running something called the Sunshine Tour. Well, David, what's the Sunshine Tour all about? Okay, well, it's a, a chance for Fiat owners, Fiat 500 owners, to bring their cars down to Bournemouth and to Lyndhurst, and have a little drive through the forest, have some fun, um, get their cars seen, and uh, just have a lovely day in the sunshine. Are you doing anything for fundraising for any charities or not? Um, not this time, though um, we you know, we'll consider it in, in the future. The sort of thing we'd like to do is actually get some uh, sponsor uh, for charity. It would be nice. I was thinking of the famous Italian run where the Mini Owners Club recreate the Italian run and go all the way down to Italy and raise money for children's homes on the way, which is a nice idea. But obviously you've got beautiful weather for this, and obviously you were telling me before about the, the reason why it's called the Sunshine Tour. Oh, yeah, so a lot of the events around um, at, above London I always consider like the north of England. And uh, what happens is that it's always raining. So I said, well, why don't you guys come down and, um, and, and see it's always sunny in Bournemouth, it's always sunny on the south coast. So hopefully, as you can see, the sun will be with us and have a great time. Well, you've got quite a lot of 500s here already. How many have you actually got in the UK that are members? Okay, we've got about uh, 500 paid-up members at any one time. Uh, some people uh, are joining all the time. Uh, we, we visit many shows, the NEC uh, being recently, and we tend to sign up some people who have either recently got their cars or would like their cars and uh, or would like to get cars, and they can sign up and uh, hopefully buy one through the club. Obviously, it's quite an unusual little car, so why do people actually choose the 500? Is it because it's easy to get parts for, or is it just because of the appeal of it? It looks quite a, a cute little car. Yeah, there, there, there are. it's easy to get the parts. There's no problem in sourcing that. They made 3.5 million of them in Italy, um, so it's, it's, not, it's not a problem. You can get more or less what you want, and for, for not uh, too, too expensive. The, the body panels are quite reasonably priced. So you're not talking like Aston Martin money for these parts? No, 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 no. Uh, maybe the, if you start doing a bit of tuning, um, it gets a little bit more expensive than a Volkswagen, but um, it's it's, it's fine, it's, uh, it's not too bad at all. Well, I think now we'll have a closer look at some of the cars.
Well, this is Janet Westcott, who's got one of the oldest uh, Fiat 500s here today. Now, Janet, this one has obviously got a full sunshine roof, and it's also got these amazing things called suicide doors. What's what's the story behind these? Um, this is how the Fiat 500s were first made with suicide doors, and then in the 1970s, they decided they weren't safe, so they brought in the L with the proper doors, and the F had the proper doors. And how long have you owned this particular one? About six, seven years. So uh, when you actually bought it, did you have to do a lot of work to it to get it back up to this sort of standard? We didn't. Fre um, friends who run a garage did it for us, and it was an absolute wreck. Um, mm. And I couldn't believe it could turn out so nice as it has done. Well, this is Ashley Shute, who's yet another member of the Fiat 500 Owners Club. Well, Ashley, what attracted you to the 500 in the first place? It was a small air-cooled car. We'd had Volkswagens for um, a few decades. Uh, we liked air-cooled cars, but we felt that now we were retired, something smaller would be adequate, and the 500 was the best choice. So obviously there's quite a, a couple of good advantages to having a car that's uh, fairly old, because you don't have to pay any road tax for a start, which has got to be a good idea for, for, for one. But uh, how long have you actually owned this particular model behind you? Well, my wife's owned it for about five years. Um, we came across it uh, just by coincidence, and uh, once we joined the 500 Club, um, we've had a lot of fun with it. Looking inside, it's a fairly basic car, though, isn't it? It's very nice and simple, I should think, to work on. But if you have a look at the driver's side, you can see the, the sort of steering column is uh, that's right, very uh, plasticky. Yeah, uh, that's that's the horn button in the front. <laughs> it's not exactly uh, over endowed with the number of dials and uh, needles you normally see in such a car. But it's nice to have the dashboard in metal, isn't it? Because that makes um, life a bit easier. For... Have you had any problems with it otherwise? Is it a good runner? Oh, it is, yeah. Um, it's been to the south of France and back. Um, it's going to Italy this year for to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the car. I'm not expecting any, any real problems. Uh, it gets a little hot, but um, nothing. And what about the gearbox? Is that a four speed or a three? Four speed. It's four speed. Right, okay. Yeah. And what other sort of things? Uh, obviously, you've got this uh, the sunroof here. What are the main differences between the other models? Do they all have sunroofs, or is this a special option? Or? Um, more, more or less, everyone you'll see will have a sunroof. They did do one, or one model without. Um, but uh, a sunroof, in this case, being an F, this is an F, um, and it has a smaller sunroof. Some of the other cars that are here today uh, have the full, what we call full rollback sunroof roof which you'll see and also the the doors on this one open in a traditional manner as opposed to some of the early cars that open the other way right now how many of these did you say were produced you said something like three million three and a, yeah about three and a half million we believe uh, were actually produced in italy through uh since um would have been 19 uh 1957 um, so what was the actual last year production then uh about 73 72 they they made the estate car jardin era a little after that but um the 126 sort of took it took its place <laughs>
quirky little Fiat 500. And it was nice to see some of the original Italian footage from the 60s. Well, after the break, the pros and cons of going on a motorhome holiday. We'll see you in a couple of minutes. Hi and welcome back. Now, in the long summer holidays, don't you wish you could forget the headaches about stuffing all your holiday gear into the back of your saloon and instead take the home with you? Aim and Nicky take a couple of motorhomes away for a long weekend. This is pure Hollywood, where the big stars get five-star treatment. It's a small American motorhome, big enough for a jumbo jet and packed with every luxury to help the overworked actor relax between takes. Great for a 12-lane freeway, but let's face it, would you like to try a Lakeland hairpin bend in, in this? this? So, with the holiday season looming, let's head for the hills into more sensibly sized British motorhomes. The Eldis AutoQuest Elite 420 and from Swift, the Contiki 650S. Motorhomes are commonplace in the States and in Europe, but here they've only just begun to challenge the caravan. Why? It's obvious when you think about it. You can leave the caravan on the drive and continue to use the family car day to day. This is much too big to take to the supermarket every five minutes. So you're left with a complete vehicle not being used all week at least. And motorhomes come dearer than caravans, of course. That Eldis has a two and a half litre diesel and costs nearly 28 and a half grand. This Swift has a two and a half litre turbo diesel and comes in at nearly 38 grand. These are not impulse buys. Don't lose heart. Most people try these on a rental basis because they do have advantages over the caravan. No 50 mile an hour limit and with the passengers strapped in way down the back it reduces that long journey earache. Most important for me the food, the drinks and the toys travel with you. The temptation with a caravan is to dump it on a site and then explore in a car. Then you realise you forgot to pack all the things the kids need in the boot. Misery. Driving impressions? Well, surprisingly, both are easy to drive, and they're similar in other respects too. Both have the Peugeot Boxer Mechanicals cabin and dash, but beyond the dinky gear lever, I definitely prefer the turbo engine in this Contiki. Come on, Eamon. Easier said than done. I really would like to try the Turbo Eldis. I'm travelling empty at the moment, so I'd guess if I stayed in the hills with the regular diesel, I'd end up with a tired left arm and MPG in the low 20s. These really are mobile homes. Both have big batteries and water tanks that make for all the luxuries. TV, video, fridge, shower, freedom. No endless hunt for the only tap. Eventual replenishing is easy via little doors along the side. Even the loo empties out into sealed cassettes. Eamon, don't you dare. Bit cramped in there. And make sure you choose one with sleeping arrangements to suit you. The eldest can sleep two, four, six, but it would make things a bit tight. So you'll all have to be on very good terms. The Contiki has a large loo and a separate shower, but you only get five beds. Now, we'll show you this just once. tight fit but a possible advantage here with all the sleeping up at one end this remains clear at the end of the day both these motorhomes would be fine for a family with small children although the eldest auto quest elite with no roof access may be safer for the kids if i were touring europe and wanted to cook for myself i'd go for the swift contiki i prefer the layout and this model has an oven so Eamon, get cooking You know, a friend of mine rents his motorhome out to lodgers. Fancy living in someone's drive? Now, me neither. Now, have you ever wondered how Formula One racing drivers get started in competitive racing? Well, Richard Warren has been investigating the first rung on the long and winding track to pole position in a Formula One Grand Prix.
There's no doubt that most of the current crop of Formula 1 drivers started their careers in go-kart racing. And people who haven't raced a go-kart will not understand really the, the difference between learning how to drive a go-kart and then going into a Formula 1 car. But today we're looking at indoor go-karting and a way that you can very cheaply get into a go-kart, have some fun and learn how to drive competitively at the same time. And this is the sort of go-kart that people come down to drive. So for as little as about £25 you can actually get out and have a race with some of your friends. So this is probably the best way of actually finding out if you like motor racing or not. And then if you want to take it a step further, you can follow us up through some of the race schools in England which we'll be doing in future programmes. At the moment we're in speed karting is uh, indoor go-kart stadium in Warrington and I'm with Joe Dean who's the circuit manager. Well Joe, what is the best thing to do if you want to come into a go-kart stadium like this? Well the first thing to start off with I suppose is what we do, arrive and drive, where you just generally turn up and you pay for your laps around the circuit. Available from all years, from four years upwards. And how much is that going to cost you roughly? Starts at £2.50 and then you can stay as long as you want and pay as much as you want. Ah, so it really is quite a good way of finding out if you can handle the cart and then go on something else maybe a little bit later on. It's certainly the cheapest form of motor racing you're going to get. Right, well, Joe, this is the actual go-kart now. It's obviously a, a fairly standard chassis. Um, what about the actual engine, though? What sort of speeds can th this sort of thing get up to? Well, we had the radar down about three months ago. Down the back straight, bang on 40 miles an hour. That's very quick, isn't it, this, given the sort of height off the ground you are? It is. Uh, two inches off the ground, and it, you feel as though you're low-flying. And obviously, with this, this chassis, it's obviously sort of standard go-kart chassis, but I understand you had quite a lot of um, people saying that it's very, very good for handling. It's been developed over the years by the particular company that make this one and over the years, it, without a doubt, shines above everything else. really is top quality. And have you had many people who've, who've come in here, say, as a beginner and actually gone on to race and go-karts or not? I now go down to the local circuit and probably recognise half the people down there as beginners from our indoor circuits. So it's quite a... because it, obviously people don't realise that the actual characteristics of this go-kart, and I must speak as a journalist here, and the, the guys I know have, have gone up through motor racing into Formula 1 now, nearly 98% of them have started off in go-karting, so uh, it speaks to itself, doesn't it? Uh, it's a superb stepping stone, and it's cheap as well, so they actually come down, but once they get the bug, once it bites, they've got to go further. It's uh, good racing at this level. The other question I've got to ask, and people ask it of me as well, when you're actually racing these things, and you've got maybe five or six carts in it in a very tight situation, if somebody does take a spin, um, it's not really that painful, is it? Because if you go over, it's, uh, you've got your crash and one, you've got your overalls. Um, what normally happens on a, a normal racing night? <laughs> well, that's a killer. A normal racing night, if somebody spins, we, we have the beauty of having a very wide circuit, as I said earlier on, so you should be able to avoid the spinners in front of you. If there is impact then obviously the side pods uh, take absorb most of the shock people can get hurt as it motor racing is a dangerous sport and at 40 miles an hour if you take a full impact it can be rather uncomfortable but most incidents occur on the corners themselves where the speeds are down to 15 20 25 miles an hour so relatively safe but we're only talking about a small percentage of that I mean, it's very unusual to have something like that happen because most people are aware of what's going on and they're not all lunatics are they well, no, they do, <laughs> not, not all, they do have a full safety briefing before they go out on the circuit and obviously we make everybody aware that we want to keep the event as close to motor racing as we possibly can. They're not bumper cars, they're not designed as bumper cars as you can see. We know they're not professionals out on the circuit, there's going to be that little bit of contact, but we have to run a safe, tight ship and that's what we aim to do. Of course, the big difference about this sort of uh, type of indoor sport is the fact that you're really out on your own. Once you've actually been through that briefing session, you're actually driving the car, you haven't got an instructor with you. And unlike some of the other racing schools we'll be looking at, you're, you're entirely free to do what you want. Well, within the rules and regulations, yes. Um, they, they tend to wait till a faster driver goes past them. They'll latch onto the back of that driver and follow them round. If, if you could close your eyes after practice laps and open them again, 20 minutes later, once they're into the second, third round of racing, totally different drivers. Um, the, the speeds increase, the, the actual ability of the driver comes out, and you get some really good close racing.
Mm, well, keep watching because in future weeks, Richard will be taking a look at different racing schools that offer different levels of racing tuition. After the break, Mike Rutherford will be having one of his classic conversations with racing legend Sterling Moss. And we'll also be visiting mechanic John Wright, who's getting rid of a nasty scratch on a Citroen. So we'll see you in a couple of minutes. Hello again, welcome back to Four Wheels Good. Now, it's at this time of year that everyone's discussing Formula One. Mike Rutherford and Sterling Moss are at it as well, so let's wing our way back over to Sterling's house to hear the details. Jack Villeneuve actually, I think, feels that the cars, he says that, that they're not fast enough. I don't think he really means that. What he really means is they're not difficult enough. Mm. The more difficult a car is to drive, the more skill it takes to make it respond. You and see, that's what we want. I wonder, actually, if we're in a situation now, you, you mentioned me, I'm, I'm too old, but if you grabbed a kid who was 18 and pretty fit and uh, started him off, you know, as a job, five days a week, practicing in a car, he could very, very quickly become F Formula One standard. Proof of that is somebody like Pedro Diniz. Pedro Diniz is not mm -hmm. in a Formula One car because he's, he showed any talent as a, as a young driver breaking into motorsport. He's in a Formula One car because he said, Daddy, I know you're rich and I'm a little rich kid and I want to get in a Formula One, so get me in it. And he's in it. And actually, everybody has a go at Pedro and um, he has humiliated himself a bit and he is a bit of an old donkey at the back of the field. But slowly but surely, he's getting the hang of it. And why shouldn't he? There's very little chance of him killing himself. Uh, with all the practice he's getting, with all those Sunday afternoon meetings when he's mixing it with these guys, slowly but surely, He's going to get there, and isn't it the case almost that anybody could do it if they've got the money and they can spend enough time at it? Well, no, I think he must have a certain aptitude, but I do agree with you that you could get a guy who's really good in carts and you could school him and train him and so yeah. on. Yes, that's quite true, but I think that goes for many sports. I think that if you get a person, uh, and, and they, uh, if a person is dedicated enough and will spend enough time, I think you can do most things. I really do. If a person is really for it, whatever it is, I think you can learn to play the piano. I can't play the piano, mm. but I'm sure if it was my whole life to be able to play it, I'm sure I could learn. Mm. And obviously, I get better with practice. Mm. And I think you can say that for a man walking on a high wire or racing a motor car or anything mm. else. Mm. But there are a certain amount of drivers, I think, who are blessed with a certain talent that others cannot achieve. Mm. I think you've got people like, say, uh, Jimmy Clark was a man who had enormous talent, mm. which was given to him by God or whatever. The same as some people have a great voice. Mm. But there's no doubt you can t some people have managed to take a terrible voice and, and mm. make money at it with it. Mm. You know. Of course, I've got a great driving talent and a great voice. I know. Um, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but what the, the point I'm trying to get at is that it, if there is no danger and you can almost, it's almost getting too easy and money d dictates everything. If you can go in with five million quid in your back pocket, you'll get a drive almost no matter how bad you are. Perhaps if it was more dangerous, these people like Pedro Diniz would be saying, hang on, I'm a little rich kid, yeah, I'm not I don't so want to risk my sure. life. Oh, I, th I think there's a lot of truth in that. Yeah. I think that, uh, I think it's one of the, you can't go backwards that's the problem but i think the only thing we can hope for is that the fia who control motor racing uh will start making rules and regulations which make the cars more sensitive to drive mm. i think if you cut down if you can cut down this enormous road holding they get mm. i mean i don't know if you know this but apparently a car doing 140 k's now it's only what 85 miles an hour mm. When it reaches that speed, it then has a sufficient downforce that it would hang on the ceiling. Yeah. At 140 k's? Yeah. I mean, it's nothing. No. And Bloody awkward when, the, when you have to do an emergency stop. Well, that's true. Well, the but, but, uh, put no, it, put the brakes on. Yeah, yeah. No, but the point is that this is, if we can cut down that sort of thing, sure. which, which is not the vehicle, I think then we can expect to see the cars becoming far more difficult. If you get things like brakes locking on, wheels spinning, mm. because you put too much power, that then you bring back those things when the driver has to sort think my god and he has to control the car mm. through the throttle and the steering what have you mm. i think then we'll see racing improve because one other problem that these great things have brought in is the actual distance in which one car could pass another is so small mm. because the braking now is unbelievable mm. and therefore the, the physically isn't that much dis mm. distance on the track sure. Yeah. And, you know, the cars are that close that when they go around a corner, really there isn't much difference with mm. the lateral G. And, um, yeah, a, a, a Formula One driver was telling me that, for example, uh, when, when you see those braking signs that used to mean something in mm. the old days, you totally ignore them. 
I mean, the, those braking yeah. indicators at, uh, at tracks all around the world. But they never put those up at the right place, you know. No. They, they, I mean, the 100 yards in, in France is quite different to 100, well, admittedly yeah. 100 metres in, in another country. Yeah. Mike Rutherford chatting with Sterling Moss. Well, it's time once again for our regular feature, Inside Motors, in which John Wright, our mechanic in residence, shows us how to repair and maintain our own vehicles. This week, he's performing a paint job and showing us how not to bodge it with paint sprays. Spanners, sockets, hard parts, I've no problem with those. However, when it comes to paint, when I try to use one of these, it looks like I've used one of these. Now I know a man who says he can achieve a body shop finish by using just an aerosol can. Now that's worth a look at. Right, we're here at High Coat in Oldham with Dave Whitehead, who's going to show us how to get a body shop finish using the aerosols. Right Dave, we've got a Citroen here with a little car park scratch. Uh, what products are we going to have to use to uh, get this finish, this wonderful finish that uh, you're sure as we're going to get? Well, the key to a really good finish is actually preparation. There's very little spray skill involved. You've got to put the time into preparation. So you need to start from the basics. Oh, oh they're behind me. You need to rub the surface down, preferably to bare metal, if you can. It's hard work, but you must do it. So we're going to need some of that. Some wet and dry paper. Right, we'll have that. We'll also need some very smooth wet and dry paper, which is that one. Lovely. Right, we've got the rubbing down paper. What else do we need? This is essential. Primer. You must, must use a primer. Very, very important. Great stuff. Right, what's next? The next thing is the actual top coat that you're going to use. Obviously, got to match the car's core. You can check through the customer guide, the user guide, what exactly which colour you need, you'll find that on an identification plate, usually in the engine compartment. We're going to be using Citroen Venetian Red for that car there, and I think we'll find that on the stand along with all the Citroen products. Here it is. Lovely. What else do we need? Well, we need some thinners. Because one thing that we really have to do is make sure there's no grease on the surface that we want to spray. Tinner thinners. Tinner right. thinners. When we finish the job, what we're going to do is leave it for around about seven days and then finish it off with a high gloss polish. That'll impart a real showroom finish. That's what we want, that's it. Yep. Exactly. When people are spraying the car, the car may have been on the road for about five or six years. When we match the paint, we match it to the standard as new. So what you can do is use a restoration cutting polish on the rest of the vehicle. Obviously there's no point in trying to restore the colour on brand new paint. So what you really need to do is cut the rest of the vehicle to blend in the new paint with the existing paintwork. Great stuff. So with all these showroom finish? Absolutely, showroom finish. Guaranteed? Guaranteed. That'll do me. Right Dave, this is the problem here. Uh, let's see. Horrible little scratch. Well, unfortunately for you, John, it's actually gone across two panels. Right? So we're going to have to make a repair to both. That's going to involve a deal of masking. We're going to have to mask off the area that we're not going to spray. It's easy on that panel because it's self-contained. Mm -hmm. A little bit more difficult on this one. We're going to have to blend this area in slightly. But it's nothing that we can't handle. Great stuff. Right, where do we start? Well, what we need to do is rub this paint off. We need some, a bowl full of warm water, a bar of soap, or bar maybe, of soap. maybe a drop of, um, of washing up liquid. That just lowers the surface tension. The water actually stops the paper from clogging up with the material that you're rubbing off. Right? It is important to use wet and dry wet. Must do it. Away we go. Right, 
as you can see, we've actually cut through the top coat and we're now down to the vehicle's primer layer. What we really need to do is get rid of all this red because we're going to reapply the primer. Great stuff. The problem is if you don't get rid of the scratch, you'll cause yourselves problems later on. When you've finished it, you'll probably still be able to see some sort of indentation and you may cause yourself problems with corrosion if there's any corrosion deep in, deeply embedded in that scratch. So the trick is to get rid of the scratch completely before you even start thinking about putting paint on. Oh yes, very important. Get rid of the scratch completely. Let's get rubbing again. Okay. Thanks there to John and Dave. Well, that's it for this week. In next week's show, we'll be looking at the Seat Ibiza Cupra and the Renault Spider. We'll also be looking into the future of garage forecourts and discovering the history of the BMC mark. So until then, it's goodbye. Yeah.